put our hands together for our guests. Hopefully they'll join us momentarily. We've got, right now we've got uh, Nancy Allen, Ronnie Cox, Ray Rice, Richard Eaton, Donna Keegan, Mark Carlton, Yolanda Williams, Jess Goins, Linda Bauer, Sage Parker, Andrea Sachs, Diane Robin, and hopefully soon, S.T. Let's get started. So what was it like filming in uh, Texas? It, it, the crime written near future dystopian Detroit, actually Texas, at uh, that time of the year when you guys filmed Robocop, the original. The original. Well, I'll, I'll start. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dallas, Texas. And of course, the movie takes place in Detroit, so naturally we'd shoot it in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> and also outside of Pittsburgh, a, a town called Manesson at that old uh, steel mill that they had there and had the biggest blast furnaces in the world at one time there. We saw the remnants of it and uh, then we blew up the rest of it. So that, and we, uh, we, we were like kids in a, in, a, in a sandbox and blew up streets in Dallas and they told us that it, it, the streets would be destroyed shortly after so we could do whatever we wanted with them. Uh, well, those streets are still there in Dallas. So, uh, they never, they never tore them down. Anyway, I, I digress. Yeah. If you like, yeah, you can pass that around. If anybody else has a remembrance of the shooting, the, well, that time of year, how you, hot it was, perhaps. You asked about any memories of Miguel. Yes. Or, uh, I don't know if you guys know Miguel adamantly did not want me to grab his hair yes. and say, you just fucked with the wrong guy. <laughs> and, and, and he came to me before the show, before the shot, and he said, just, just said, right, don't do that. He said, don't, do not, do not grab my hair. And I said, that's, that's what this shows up. He said, no, no, he said, I, said, I don't know what I'll do. He said, I, I might hit you. And, <laughs> And I said, Miguel, you, you're, you're an actor, I'm an actor, we'll, we'll, we'll work this out. And so when we went to do that scene, he was still saying, do not grab my hair. <laughs> and so when I grab it, and, and then I have to, to Miguel's fa uh, credit, uh, three or four weeks, he came to me and said, Ronnie, he said, thank you for, for not listening to me. Because he knew that that sort of cemented the, the, what we were doing and, 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 and the, the relationship we needed to have. So, 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 so there you have it with Miguel. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys know, Miguel was a, a world-class drummer. He was, he was a, the drummer in Dean Crosby's band. So, yeah, he and Keith Moon were like this. Uh, exactly. <laughs> One of the great bathroom scenes in movies. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, well, let's see. I'm just going to say uh, it's really great to be here with everybody. Uh, my cronies from the film, we had such a great time making this movie. And, um, well, what do I want to say? Let's just say Dan O'Hurley, somehow, he ended up with the best line in the movie. Dick. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> my favorite line. So uh, here's one of my memories. It's a horrible memory, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, at the end of the film, we we're at the steel mill, and uh, I had to, of course, go in the water to be shot and all of that. And uh, it was freezing cold, and it was rusty and disgusting. And they said, you need to put on a wetsuit. So I'll tell you how vain I am. He said, I am not putting a wetsuit on. I will look like a whale in the movie. And they said, no, 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 you have to. I said, I'm not doing it. So when I got dressed, I didn't put it on. I went in that water. 
It was freezing cold. I'm amazed that I'm still alive because it was really disgusting. And so uh, anyway, after that, I said, okay, I'll put the wetsuit on. And of course, they made a picture of that. And I indeed look like a whale. So there you have it. I, I am. But um, anyway, it was a delight to make this movie every day. I really think every day it was a, it was a action packed because of Paul Verhoeven, who was truly a master filmmaker. And you could feel every second of every day that this was going to be a great film. So, And here we are, all these years later. So I'm happy to be here. And here's the lovely Sage Parker. <laughs> yeah, as, as Nancy said, the experience of making the movie in Dallas was really amazing. And the cast was terrific. Um, the greatest thing for me was to be able to work with Paul Verhoeven, who I had admired his foreign films for years. And also there was a great spirit of um, experimentation and play on the set. So we were allowed to try things, and which is, doesn't always happen, um, and improvise certain things. And one of the things um, that we had fun doing was the scene for me of, um, kissing the camera, which at the party we sort of played and talked about in the moment. So that happened pretty spontaneously and they figured out to put a plexiglass lens in front of the camera because it was something fun to do. So, um, and every day there is just that getting up and being so excited to go to the set and play with certain people. And I also wanted to say Miguel Ferrara, who was a dear friend is all, was also, in spite of the characters that he often played, one of the dearest, sweetest, kindest people with an innate sense, because of his family, of a history of both Hollywood and um, filmmaking. So it was really a joy to work with him and just really glad that everyone responded to the movie and loved it so much. So. Hi everybody, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Sage said, you know, we got a chance to meet some really incredible people. Robocop was my first film. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm a Texan, if you can't tell with my denim and my hat I'm representing today. Um, really quick, the 100 degree days are still around. That summer in 1986 was brutal. We had on these ballistic jumpsuits and vests. And it was so crazy, my previous job before doing the movie, I worked for the federal government. I used to work at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And I used to order those same ballistic jumpsuits for ATF agents. So, I, And I ended up wearing one, which was really crazy. I don't know how that worked out. But one of my fondest memories is today, I haven't seen this woman in 37 years, and we picked right up where we left off. And Sage is an incredible talent. A lot of people around us really embraced us. I'd never done a film before. Robert Doki, who the late Robert Doki, who played the chief of police, um, he gave me the most valuable advice of being in this business. I had a Walkman, and I told this story the other day, and he showed, they, the sound guy showed me how to take it all the way down the AM dial to the end, and I could listen to what was being said on the radio on the set. I had never heard terms like back to one and check the gate and things like that. And that's how I learned. I used to come to the set on days off and I would come to the night shoots and watch and listen so I could, so I wouldn't appear to be so green, you know, and naive. And that's how I survived on my, my first major movie. Can you believe my first movie is Robocop? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I was in, I was in, um, my cousin was a student at UCLA and we were sitting in a movie theater and the trailer came on. We went to see Beverly Hills Cop and in the trailer, there's my head big as day on the screen and I'm saying, he's not a guy, he's a machine and I lost it. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. That's just my little story and uh, please, we appreciate you as well. Thank you fans. <laughs> Seven years, I can't believe, and I'm still the number one favorite rape victim not in the country. <laughs> I cannot believe I can actually mention something or they go, you look familiar, and they go, you were the one who got raped. Not, 
rigged in RoboCop. So yeah, that was, um, it was an incredible experience that night, um, several nights, through uh, the heat of Dallas and running around with a really bad Dolly Parton wig on. Everybody goes, why, why did they do that to you? It's like, well, they had to cut my hair off and then they had to cut my hair off and then they had to cut my hair off, you know? So how much are you gonna put on, you know, don't want my own hair to get cut. So um, that, that part of it was a little bit crazy, but the other part is like somebody used to say, I see some of the people were asking me, how, that, how was that done? How did you do the, um, uh, the shoot you between the legs? What they did is they squib the actual skirt and there's a special effects guy that's attached to a monofilament, you know, off camera and at the right cue, I spread my legs out and because at that moment they can allow it to explode. So the gun shot goes off and it explodes and it's the skirt is scored so that you know you can see it rips and then he drops me and uh, you see him. <laughs> oh, sorry, it was, it was kind of funny watching it happen. Uh, it, his pants are all cut up and he, they put a big sponge of blood, you know, fake blood in his pants and so he starts screaming and he squeezes down on it and then all that blood just goes and all that. And you know, it's a cherished moment for a woman when she gets her <laughs> immediate revenge on the attack that they did on me. So, you know, if anyone wants to know, yeah, that's how I was feeling if in the moment, oh, there, you got what you deserved. But all in all, that was a great shoot. Had a wonderful time with Paul Verhoeven. Oh my God, to work with him. Peter Weller, who, oh my God, the robotics. I swear to you, it's like I was working with a machine. He was so on point with every single move. And the insight on that is I felt so sorry for him because it was so hot and they didn't really plan for the fact that he couldn't really sit down and stuff, you know? So they had this special perch for him. And, Anyway, that was, that was tough, but it was great and um, enjoyed the heck out of it. And I'm glad that you guys are all still enjoying it because I certainly am. There should be a second mic up there as well, is there, on the, on the back row to the share. Oh, I love my It is such a pleasure to be here. This is so fun um, and remembering the, the movie and being on set and everybody's so wonderful and professional and wonderful. Um, Diane and I were in the scene together with Miguel Ferrer where he gets his knee shots and he gets killed and we are partying with him and the scene starts and, and um, the scene starts with close up of me doing a line of cocaine on this glass table and I came in and there was like looked like cocaine everywhere like tons of it and lines and I just freaked out and I said you want me to actually do that yes you got to do it every take and I'm not what is this and they said it's powdered sugar and I thought how clever powdered sugar and um but I was afraid to put that in my body and so I said, is there a doctor on set? And yes, they called the doctor. And I said, would you please do it? He said, it's fine. Nothing wrong with me. It's perfectly fine. It's not going to hurt you. And I said, would you do a line for me, please? So the, the, the doctor on set snorted a line of powder sugar and said, see? So then we, it took seven, you know, from different angles, seven takes, you know, of me inhaling that how to shoot in the cocaine. I guess I was sweet for a whole month. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Diane. Thank you guys so much for having us here. We're all so happy to be here. I've not seen her since RoboCop, since I've seen my sister, my naughty sister. But um, when I got that audition for RoboCop, it was last minute, they said, you know, run over, Paul Verver wants to meet you. So I get there and I do the scene for him. He goes, I love it. He goes, but why aren't you doing cocaine? I said, well, why would I do cocaine? He goes, it's in the script. I said, I didn't get a script, honey. I just got this five minutes ago. He goes, do it again and do it like you're on coke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I go in, I get the part and I'm so happy. And they take us to this fabulous place on Sunset to get the clothes. And I had that cool, lovely dress, which I wish I would have gotten. But anyway, it was a great dress until you get to Dallas, Texas. It was like living in a green cow. It was so hot. I was like, oh my God, I hate this dress, but whatever. So we get there and Paul Verhoeven 
was like a little imp. He was so excited to be there. He loved this scene. He loved directing it. It was just so much fun to be on set with him. And then he said, Deanna, I want to talk to you. I said, what? He goes, I think maybe it'd be a good idea if you and the other girl kiss. And I said, I'm thinking maybe no. <laughs> and he goes, why? I said, honey, my mother's going to see this movie. I already have a guy snort cocaine out my boobs. I said, it's too much. We're good. <laughs> he said, okay, okay, we're fine, we're fine. So all night, I didn't know that it was baby powder. I thought it was laxative or something because I was like, Ugh. <laughs> it doesn't make me nuts. You heard it was baby powder? I asked what it was. And I said, it's baby powder. Was it like it was not baby powder. Anyway. Um, and the people always said to me, well, do you think that you were um, a model or a hooker? I said, well, what do you think? <laughs> because in the script it says we're models, but awfully friendly for models. And then somebody here the other day was talking to me and he said, oh, I thought that you girls worked with Bob Morton. I said, well, why would you think that? He said, because he says, I like intelligent women. I said, honey, do you believe everything a man says? I said, no, 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 no. why would you think that? So I did the movie, kind of forgot about the movie, and then my daughter said, you know, mommy, everybody's watched this movie. I said, you're kidding me. She goes, no, everybody in college, they know all the lines, they know all this, and you're the co-core. I said, I was a model. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the cast is amazing. I think the fact that this movie has, still has legs all these years later, there is something magical about this movie, and I'm just so proud to be part of it. Yay. It's honored. It should be honored. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm Belinda. I was in Robocop too. So, um, thank you. <laughs> and that was just wonderful to be in that film following Robocop, which I loved. It was just an incredible film. Paul Verhoeven, all of you, yeah, amazing. And, and working with Peter, I, I agree, he was incredible. Absolutely in character, so specific, so dedicated. Um, thinking about, we, we shot in LA, so, you know, we had an easy time, but we were, we were not in Dallas in the heat. Um, and, and what was unusual for me um, in, in the making of this film is that Irv Kirshner, the director, he was very open to being innovative. So there was a, a fellow on, on the set called um, Frank Miller, and he was a writer, and he was rewriting the script every day. So we would shoot a, a, a scene, like shoot the whole scene, and then, and then he would come up with something different in terms of the characters, and it ended up being a completely different movie than, than the original script, like quite different. Um, and I, I love, I played the bad, like a badass, <laughs> evil Dr. Fax, who was like, it was just fun, it's so fun to play a, a bad, right? Like, hooker model, evil scientist, you know, all of that stuff. You can just really let your inner whatever out. And it, it was, and Irv was very welcoming to, you know, yeah, just to develop the script in a way that, that he felt would be interesting. And Frank Miller, the, who, who did a lot of animation, he went on to become a very, very, well-known director, that that was the writer on the set who was doing the rewrites. I, I think he directed 300, um, that film. He, yeah, he, he's become really a remarkable director in his own right. And Irv Kirshner was, was terrific to work with, as was Peter and, and all the cast. So, it, it, yeah, it was, it was really a great experience. And to be part of the Robocop legacy, yeah, really, yeah, it's it's an honor. It's it's lovely to be amongst all of you. So, thank you. Okay, let's go down to the bottom, the second row. Maybe start with SD. Oh, oh, it's me. We're oh, hi, hi, everybody. Thanks for turning out. I played uh, Bixby Snyder, the little Woo. guy that keeps showing up on the uh, TV screen. 
and inconvenient moments like the uh, robbery in the liquor store. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I do remember uh, shooting that day. Being in Texas, naturally, it was real hot, real humid. But uh, Paul Verhoeven was a great director. He, uh, he brought that character out in me. And uh, I, I have to th thank him for that. Um, I, I shot the dream scene, which every guy dreams of, especially if you're like me, five foot six with two taller blondes, one on the charm. Yeah. It was a wonder. It was an eye opener. Thank you very much. Oh, SD, SD, can we, can we hear the line, SD? Can we hear the line? I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> hey, could you give the, the mic to Richard? Richard, right, there you go. Hi. Thanks. All right, a little bit odd man out. I ended up playing uh, Alex Murphy Robocop in the series Robocop the last week's season. How are you? Yeah. It's an honor. Are we like telling a quick stories? Is that what we're doing? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Something? Yes. Uh, okay. Two stories. All right, number one, I'll, I'm cast. They, they take me out to, uh, I think it was Eagle Rock, to rob a teens to get into the suit. I wasn't cast yet. But there was a bit of a humor in that. So they bring me out, and I'm looking at this amazing place, and they said, all right, let's, uh, let's get the suit out. And these four guys wheel out Peter Weller's suit from the second movie. I said, okay, let's get him dressed up. All right. So they dress me up and they put me up. They said, get the helmet on. And five guys who are producers care about one thing, my lips. <laughs> staring, staring. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Looks like Peter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they said, all right, try to walk. Well, it turned out that Peter had, when he made the mold for the second suit, was because, I guess in the first movie, it was polyurethane, I believe. Anyway, he wanted a heavier feel to get the robotics. But he pointed his left foot out during the mold. Didn't bother him, apparently. Well, I had to wear this thing for 16 hours a day for 22 episodes with my left foot pointed out. And I always wanted to tell him that. I was just about to tell him that yesterday. I said, and about the left foot. He goes, yeah, right, okay, bye. <laughs> so anyway, it was an honor to meet him, and it's an incredible honor to be on stage with you guys. Really, it's just uh, phenomenal to, to have done that. Thank you very much. Hi there, folks. I'm Gabe Damon. Did uh, Hob in the second movie, and uh, I agree. It's just I'm just grateful to be a part of it and be here with all these these folks that are yeah. the Robocop legacy. And uh, you know, I was 12 when I did this movie, so my memories are all tinged, you know, come through the lens of a, of a 12 year old. I thought it was just really cool to get to you know handle guns and, and uh, say cuss words without getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, uh, you know, I agree with everything Belinda said. Uh, you know, in my, in my memories of doing movies, the, the bigger the movie, generally the less fun it would be for a kid, you know, because it was more serious, and then, you know, the smaller movies were, you had more fun, but there was something about that set, truly, it was one of the funnest sets that I was ever on, and it really was Urban, Urban Kirshner was, was, was great. It was also really, like you say, collaborative, and Frank was changing the script a lot. That's my little story for you. Oh, I do, I'm so glad I get the chance to find because I haven't seen Nancy forever. To apologize for whatever 12 year old glee I had, probably for getting to strangle you with the movie. I'm sure I was thrilled about it, and I doubt it was the same experience for you. But uh, I made it. Um, in my memory, the, the scene where I'm strangling uh, Officer Lewis, there's no line there. And, uh, and Frank was, you know, a person who was very open, and I, I'd like to hang out with Frank. And he, he seemed to like me. He was a he was graphic novel, comic book guy, and I was 12. He liked it. We, we hung out and stuff. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm choking Officer Lewis. Can I say, you look a little out of breath. I, I asked him, and he said, yeah, I love that. He loved it. we got to ask Irvin. And, and we went to Irvin and asked him to say, well, he said, let's we'll do some with it and some without it. You know? and, and I thought, well, that's not good. <laughs> and it did. So I, you know, I don't know where my writing credit is, but I wrote that line. That's my line. <laughs> <laughs> wow.
Father Holy Yell. More blood, more blood. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing he said, I was on a set, Clay Miller, and he said, these are your prisoners, what do you want to do to them? And I said, well, I want them to kneel down right here, their hands behind their head. And he uh, said, so we need to get a dead guy. So he put the guy on the floor, and he took a spray bottle and a candy bottle, I was doing the ejection. I like painting. I said, Paul, blood flows from a wound, not from a infection. Infection, I like. And so the, the other thing about Paul is that he signed the first poster to me and said, See you in all my next movies. Which I did, did, so I got to go and introduce Arnold to the girl with three breasts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to open up the floor for some audience questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, we'll get you a mic. Questions, people? This is your chance. Yes. Here we Um, to all the cast members of the RoboCop movies, I know how the RoboCop movies all took place in the future, so whenever you watch RoboCop or RoboCop 2 or whatever, um, how do you guys feel about the technology that was introduced in the movie and how do you guys feel about the stuff they got right and the stuff they didn't get right? Um, so I just, what are your, what are your opinions on that? It was because of him that they had GPS, which of course we did not have in those days. So that was that really came from him and all the studies, and you know he was totally into science and all of that stuff. So I think that's kind of fun. Now it seems I don't know. It doesn't seem I don't think it seems antiquated, but we're certainly we're not there yet with AI and all, right? Four Tauruses. Cars. Oh my yeah. God! This <laughs> sucks. Two thousand. Right. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, I remember it, it did talk about it being futuristic, and I, I think that those costumes, the jumpsuits, that the co I mean, those were like really so stupid. I think, and uh, and uh, Paul hated the helmets. We had to have the helmets. He said, get rid of them. Get rid of them. They're horrible. I hate them. But I think now technology, of course, is far advanced. How about the science? Yeah. yeah, the thing that strikes me when I see the film and look back on it in terms of technology, it, it's also just in the craft, the way the film itself was crafted. I mean, when you think now we take CGI and, um, you know, IA is, AI is coming into play, all of those sounds that were made, this was pre, when you think, it was really pre-computer, before people had personal computers or they were really ubiquitous in filmmaking for special effects. All those sounds were, were handcrafted by people. The technology of the perspective from RoboCop's perspective was something that would, had not been done. And that too is, you see that all the time in any kind of sci-fi where things are on the screen itself. That had not been done. There were, um, so I, I feel like there's a great, um, not debt owed, but there should be some homage to the crew and the sound people and the technicians and those people who did those special effects. That made that movie at a time when, and I know there is craft in doing films now with all the CGI and the digital effects, but that, the way it was done then really took something special. In Phil, Phil Tippett. Yeah. Phil Tippett, who did all the little miniature. I mean, that was... Yeah, miniatures and all, all of those things. It's, it's about to be a lost craft, and it's, it's really in the rearview mirror now, and I, I love the fact that RoboCop has held up, and I think a lot of it is for that reason. It was quite something when it came out, so I think that those people really are the ones at the forefront of that film, and there was so much, in my way of thinking, that they got right. 
that there, there were so many things that came to pass just in the realm of filmmaking itself, technology, in that technology. Well, Paul Verhoeven never did anything by half measure. And, and if you recall at the end when the old man unceremoniously fires me uh, and they they shot me and and, and the, Paul wanted as you, as, as you can see when they shot Kenny he, he, he never did anything halfway so when they shot me out the out the window there they put double squibs uh, on both side and double squibs in the back and and when they shut those it literally put me to my knees and, and I couldn't work for like half a day because because it, it, it just knocked me out so much now I've done a lot of things in movies where, where but I've never had anything put me down quite like that. You can deliver us? Did, did, did that <laughs> well, deliverance, you know, we did all our own stunts in deliverance, and, and, and but the, nothing as dangerous as that. I, I mean, I almost drowned once, and, and Ned almost drowned once, but, uh, but that was a sort of a different sort of thing. We, I, we got caught in a in a sort of a whirlpool, and Ned got caught in one of the what they call a hydraulic, and and and, and he was fighting to get up, and it was three or four feet below the surface, and then finally he he gave up and went down, and then the, the river shot him way down, like fifty yards down, and that's how he got out. So that you you end up doing thing you never intend to do anything. Dangerous in a, in a film, we but do a lot of in Robocop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I, and no extra stunt pay either. Is it too much for Gordon? I got a five hundred dollar bump for getting out. Uh, you did. I was with uh, Clarence on the on the street that we blew up, and uh, one of the uh, fifty caliber guns blew up a big storefront, and the glass went flying, and got me and Clarence a little bit in our right cheeks. Wow. A little. Few little pieces, and um, I got a five hundred dollar bump for that. All right, that's what they call a stunt bump. And, uh, we did a lot of our own stunts, like uh, when we were hanging out of the back of that uh, truck, and we made Bobby fly. And, you know, there's a patrol car right behind us, and we're hanging out. We're, we don't have any safety straps on or anything with our shotguns, trying to you know shoot at the cops, and. Didn't think any of it, uh, uh, anything about it at the time, but afterward I thought, Jesus, what if we, f what if we fell out of the back of the truck in front of this patrol car? We'd be dead. But we didn't think about that. But you needed to talk. I mean, like reality. <laughs> That's it. Would have been a good touch, yeah. <laughs> so I got another dollar bump. So I'm going to shave that from going through the wall for a while. And then bust out the window. Um, hi, it's an honor to be in front of all of you right now, and um, uh, this question is mainly for Nancy, but anybody else can chime in if they want to. Um, I personally think that Anne Lewis is a really important character and like really unappreciated with the, in like the franchise and stuff. Like she kickstarts Robo's rediscovery of himself. She saves him from death and all that stuff. And I wanted to know what like your personal take and like opinions on the character are. Uh, I love Anne Lewis, and um, I received the script from my agent, and I took it out of the package, and I saw RoboCop, and I called this. They're gonna change this title, right? You know, that was the first thing, but I picked up the script and I thought, I'll read a few pages. I read it immediately, the whole thing. And when I got to Anne, I just felt really um, very passionate about her. I desperately wanted this character. I desperately wanted to play this role. My father had been a New York City cop, so I felt like I know this person, I know this relationship, and um, I um, feel really honored that I got to play her 
and um, especially especially in the first film because that relationship that they have, which is which is so important, um, and I will say it uh, it was the first time in my career I got so many letters from young girls that were so inspired by her. So um, very very special, and I'm really honored. I thank you for that question. All right. Let's thank our room. Yeah, we run out of time here, so let's thank our panel. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate